Hey gang, uh, it's Eric Cohen, uh, producer and co-host of this show, The Cinephiles. Uh, we have to my left, Andre Joseph, co-host. We have to his left, Jeff Gallishaw, our fellow co-host and host and producer of Unfinished Business. We hope to have more episodes of that coming up soon. Welcome to uh, this edition of The Cinephiles. Today we're going to talk about prison dramas. And because <laughs> prison dramas vary in all sorts of kind of like types, we decided to sort of narrow it down a bit. We're not going to talk about POW dramas, prisoner of war dramas. We're going to save that topic for another episode because that deserves a whole right yeah. episode on its own. We're just going to we're just going to sort of like do an overview of the prison drama. We're just going to discuss films that we've all seen and maybe there's the odd film that no one's ever heard of. Uh, I don't know. I. I wish I did more research into this before we did this. I don't know what the precedent setter was for the prison, the on-film prison drama. I'm sure there were silent movies on prison dramas and all that stuff. I mean, in my mind, when I think of like one of the earliest prison dramas I can think of might be um, I Am a Fugitive from a Chain Game, okay. a Mervyn Leroy Le drama from the early 30s which starred uh, Paul Mooney, who was the original Scarface. Uh, Paul Mooney, who was the Marlon Brando of his time, uh, and uh, that was a film. The same topic was was the subject of a film called *The Man Who Broke a Thousand Chains*, which starred Val yeah. Kilmer as a made-for-TV film. I saw that one. That was based on the same guy that that film was about. But there's, I, I'm sure there was a prison drama before that, you know. And then you have a whole genre of women in prison films, which we could probably oh, do a whole yes. episode on as oh, well, yeah. right? <laughs> but what is it before we get into like discussion of film specifically? What is the appeal to a prison drama? Um, I think it might be like a kind of a scared straight thing where you can make a compelling story but also show why you would never want to be in this and the things you have to overcome to survive and maybe, or the, the infamous one where you're wrongly in prison and you, you know, you're trying to survive. That's when I start thinking of films like Lock Up with Sylvester Stallone. No, not a drama <laughs> by any Okay, we're talking about lockup. Yes, right? with, Sylvester lock up with Sylvester Stallone. You had the douchebag warden that's played by Donald Sutherland. Yes, <clears throat> and then the recent film he did, Escape yes. Plan. <laughs> you had the douchebag warden played by Jim Caviezel or a Caviezel. 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 <laughs> the guy who, formerly known as Jesus Christ, <laughs> right? So th those kind of fall in line with with the sort of cliche associated with that kind of thing. Even if we're going to talk about you know, Escape from Alcatraz, mm -hmm. which is a little more down-to-earth take on it. <laughs> but still, there, there is an antagonistic relationship between Clint Eastwood's character and Patrick McGowan's warden as well. Although he's not quite as douchebaggy as, or, or cartoonishly douchebaggy as later villains. You have like escape from prison, prison dramas, and you just have prison dramas where they're just stuck in prison and how do they survive. They become yeah. about surviving as opposed to escaping. Right. So do we want to, let's bring up what, since this was Andre's idea, actually, this is your topic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Give us a title. Give us the first film you'd like us to talk about. All right. Well, I think the first one that stands out for me is uh, Bad Boys with Sean Taylor. Oh, yes. Okay. Very good film. Yeah. And not the Will Smith film. Not the no, Will Smith Michael Bay directed. I know there was some beef with that, uh, with <laughs> the director Rick Rosenthal, but basically this was the movie he did after Fast Times at Richmond High, which if he had continued doing comedies, he would have been like another John Belushi type. But right. this showed the promise that he would deliver as an actor going forward with his career, playing, you know, this Chicago punk kid. He tries to commit a robbery. His friend gets killed. He gets caught. And he's thrown into a juvenile prison where basically it's him trying to survive against Clancy Brown playing the albino. Like this, yeah, the, the <laughs> albino. And then you had S.A. Morales playing oh, the guy he has beef with on the say. outside. He gets caught after raping his girlfriend played, played by, by Ali Sheedy. <laughs> and their whole beef ends up kind of colliding in the prison. Until a showdown at the end. And, 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 and it should make clear there is no douchebag warden. No. Really character. No, not really. It's really not interesting that the, the, the prison employees are presented very sympathetically. Yes. For the most part. 
Except, well, Jim Moody kind of. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true, true, true. I mean, uh, but they're they're not they're they're, they're it's, it's interesting that they're not cliche. It has its cliches like any other prison drama, but it really is about how Penn's character he he doesn't really go through like a change in the sense that he's going to come out of prison and be a reformed guy. He's stuck there. But it's really about like certain choices and consequences and a moral code that he has. Yeah, but at, the, at that time you had, I mean, we had mentioned uh, as, a, as a possible film series to bring up during this discussion, uh -huh. penitentiary, pen, the penitentiary <laughs> series, right? Which was, which was very popular, right? Very grindhouse-y kind of prison drama. Mm -hmm. That came out around that time, and there, and there were films that, were kind of like the bad boy ass, even though it's a juvenile situation, juvenile prison situation, even though it's less exploitative than, you know, other films that are coming out at the time. There were a lot of, there were a bunch of films that were popular that were prison dramas where they were just stuck there. And so it's all about surviving and, and first, being a part of the society that's developed there and how do you survive that society. It was the first film where I saw a prison rape. So I wouldn't say it was that, yeah, I wouldn't <laughs> say it was that unique. But what was unique about it was that it approached it in a very grown-up, smart, more of a down-to-earth, realistic way than other films that were coming out. You know, okay. there's something about, like, the, the opening titles where they show the pictures of all the characters when they were just small children, and then you see them in the prison later in the film. And there was, like, the, the, like the little black kid that's in there, yeah. and he ends up getting gang-raped by Clancy Brown, and they throw him off the, the guardrail. That's some heavy stuff. Yeah, that was a shocking yeah, moment. Yeah, to be young like that. And, you know, also great soundtrack, by the way. A lot of, like, early 80s funk music, which I also enjoy about the film. It's a solid film. Yeah, I have to say, it's, it's a really, it's, it's one of the, those films that did mark, define Sean Penn's career. Yeah. Because... Uh, who would have guessed that Spicoli <laughs> would have done yeah, that as like, his next yeah, film? Right? De Niro, you know? Mm -hmm. Exactly. What about something like Shawshank Redemption? Um, well, like with Shawshank Redemption, that was something I didn't really expect much from. I saw the trailer, and I was, and no offense, I've seen Tim Robbins act in films before and was never really that impressed by him. So this was really the film that really sh opened my eyes to how deep as an actor he could be. Well, the player was before. I know, but I hadn't seen oh. the player at that point. This is really my first, I would say, really big Tim Robbins So film. your only exposure to, to, to Tim Robbins was Howard the Duck? Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> and other bit roles in Fraternity Vacation. All right. <laughs> so, you know, but when I saw this film, you know, it really opened my eyes to his talent. And also, I mean... I, me and Morgan Freeman have a love-hate relationship, so I really like this one. I hadn't read the short story, but like this was a film where I liked it the first time, but I find that every time after that, that first time, I find something more to notice or a little detail that makes it more of an enriching experience. It's one of those films that there's some films where you watch and you, even if you know they're based on books, when you watch it, it feels like you're reading a book. It doesn't shy away from anything. It has all the wrong man convicted. They find out the truth. And then, the, and of course, your evil warden's uh, subplot. And again, Clancy Brown. How could Brown. you be so obtuse? <laughs> I mean, and it has Clancy Brown again. Clancy it's, Brown. Yeah, playing a guard. <laughs> yeah. And just the sequence when he plays the opera and is willing to go to the hole, that is like one of my favorite sequences in the film, other than, of course, his escape. I refuse to call him Clancy Brown, by the way. What? What I always want to call him Clergan Brown. <laughs> Why do you want to call him Clergan? Clergan? Come on, <laughs> Highlander. I think Shawshank Redemption is okay. It's one of those films, again, if I was hungover, it's on like oh Saturday. Oh my God. Like, <laughs> I think it's better than a guilty pleasure film. Okay, I think, at it's, least a, I think it's okay. I think it's, it's you know, I... <sighs> why, why am I not raving about it? No, I feel answer. like it's a... It's a I, I hate to, to use Hollywood? this term, a Disneyfication of, of a prison drama kind of thing. I'm also, I think Dernbot, I tend to, I can be a fan of, of, of Dernbot's work, but I'm really getting sick and tired of his obsession with Stephen King. I agree, <laughs> yes. You know, uh, that's one part of it. I find that Shawshank Redemption is one of those films that I, I, I like, I'll think of a scene in the movie and I realize, no, I'm talking about The Green Mile and vice <laughs> versa. It's, I just think they're too similar in a lot of ways. Okay. I don't know. There, there's things about it where I just feel it's, it's a little too septically clean for me, <laughs> for what, what, what I feel like a prison drama should be. Okay. Especially a prison drama that takes place in that period of time, right? When prison conditions were pretty goddamn bad, right? 
Okay. Uh, so you feel it should have been more like Brubaker with Robert Redford? Uh, well, Brubaker wasn't a period piece, and that was set in the 70s, and that looked like a harsher prison environment <laughs> than anything that we see in Shawshank Redemption, which was supposed to take place, what, from the 40s straight through to the like, 60s, early yeah. 70s? Mm -hmm. um, and I, I just I find there's something about it that feels synthetic to me. Okay. It always has, always will. I, I acknowledge it's a very well put together film. It is a very well acted film. Would you recommend it? It depends on, 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 on what kind of movie fan. There, there are certain movie fans that would be like, oh, yeah, you'll like this film. And there are okay. certain movie fans that would be like, it's no Brubaker. It's no, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's no bad boys. It's no, you know, there's, there's nothing, you know. There's nothing gritty about it. It's very Hollywood polished. Very polished. It's almost, to me, it's like watching, I feel like I'm watching a fantasy like an idealized take on that kind of thing. Wow. Which is weird mm -hmm. because they're in prison and they're not obviously not having a good time <laughs> and they're running up against conflict. They hit all the, the parts that you're supposed to have in a prison drama, okay. right? But there's still something about it that's just a little too, I hate to use the word squeaky clean, a little too idealized, a little too- I'd go more idealized than squeaky clean. Fantasy clean. for me, yeah. <laughs> uh, about how that's presented, which which has always kind of rubbed me the wrong way about that film for some reason. And that's okay. just a personal taste thing. Okay. Uh, but I acknowledge it's a well-made film. I acknowledge it's a well-acted film. I'm, I'm kind of on par with you. I mean, I enjoy the movie for what it is, but yeah, I mean, it's very polished. I mean, that was the same year Forrest Gump came out, so it has that same kind mm. of- Mm -hmm. sentimentality to it where there's really nothing I don't want to say unrealistic about it just it, it feels clean it, it just feels like okay. you know you, you have this arc with Tim Robbins going to prison for something he didn't do then he ultimately you know finds out the truth and he's trying to get out I, I, I personally like the Morgan Freeman arc a little better than his story just because he never wants to get out. Like those scenes where he goes to the parole board and he just makes up whatever because that's what he's used to. And mm -hmm. I think that's reflective of the times where, you know, African Americans who were used to going to the colored line of the bathroom or going to the colored table at a diner, something that paralleled with Morgan Freeman's character who just feels he doesn't fit with the outside world. So so we talked about Shawshank. Do we want to talk about Green Mile since since that's another Durambot Stephen King thing? We can. It I has like fantasy about. elements to it, you know. Um, I feel for that film, maybe how you feel more about the Shawshank Redemption where I just felt it was a little too Hollywood. Maybe it was a fantasy element. And I felt like each prisoner had their own little personality type. And you know, of course, you have the saintly black man who's actually innocent, who has these powers. And then, you know, well, spoiler, then, you know, once he dies, he transfers the powers to Tom Hanks, who's old and telling this story. And I mean, it has a lot of good actors in it. I just, by the end of it, I think it's an okay film, but to me, it's not a remarkable film. Should we talk about uh, Escape from Alcatraz? Yes. Okay. The last collaboration be between Don Siegel and uh, Clint Eastwood. Clint Eastwood. Well, he they escaped, did five literally. films together. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, with Coogan's Bluff. They did a really bizarre film together called The Beguiled. Yeah, The Beguiled is the closest thing uh, Eastwood and Don Siegel would do together that would be like a horror film. Okay. I mean, Siegel did Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Clint Eastwood did Play Misty for Me, which is technically <laughs> a horror yes. film. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But The Beguiled is the closest thing they would do together that's a horror <laughs> film. And the less least said about that, the better. It's a really interesting film. It's really, I mean, at the time, it was probably really unique for either of them. But that's not what we're talking about. We're going to talk about Escape from Alcatraz, uh, Clint Eastwood. It's based on a uh, sort of inspired by a true story. Uh, Frank Morris, the guy who actually escaped. And he was never found, right? It's they the never recovered the bodies, apparently. They tried searching all over the San Francisco Bay Area and nothing. And, uh, and the theory is that he couldn't have survived. Right, because of the tidal waves. Right. Just, the, just the distance to San Francisco would be too much to get through. And what we have here is basically an escape drama. But that's a, that's a solid flick. Yeah. yeah you know, one of the earlier uh, Clint Eastwood films that I actually really liked. Yeah, and it's, and it's interesting. I, I think it's an interesting, it, it almost, for me, it almost works like a heist film. 
yeah. in a sense where, sense. where it's very and like clinical and how detailed and how like the process of how they're going to escape, like how they're how they like order in certain paints and pretending that they're they're into like painting, right? <laughs> but they're using that to create like fake paper mache heads of themselves, and so they can stuff it in their in their bunks. So the guards won't suspect anything, you know, little things like that, or they create like you know they 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 like they re, they find out that the the infrastructure is is very loose, mm -hmm. where they can just like like chisel out like little holes in their cells, and so they use that paint and paper mache right. to create like fake, you know, and fake dummies, which is yeah. kind of right. creepy. <laughs> right, and they're kind of creepy. It's it's really interesting. It's also interesting how they get into like people who are uh, initially for the plan. And they chicken out the last second. Yeah. Larry Hankin. Yeah. That's Larry who Hankin. I remember uh, right. the most from that film. And, and, oh, go ahead. War and an early performance by Fred Ward. Early appearance yeah. by and Fred Ward. Shockingly looking young, because I've always just remembered him as the old guy from, like, Tremors. Is, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, when I think of Fred Ward, I think of either The Right Stuff or uh, Remo Williams. Mm. Okay. Uh, <laughs> right but, Stuff I never saw. <laughs> Remo Williams I have seen. Uh, right Stuff's <laughs> awesome. I've it's just never seen. so good. You have to see that. It's one of the great, great movies of okay. these. And then you have Patrick McGowan's character, who's the warden of Alcatraz. He's kind of arrogant, whatever, but he's not necessarily a sadistic. He's not like a cliche sadistic warden. No, he's, he's very clean cut. Very just, clean cut. Uh, just trying to do his job. Just trying to do his job. Papillon, an interesting compare contrast to that, you have a character who's constantly trying to escape and constantly fails and winds up just spending his entire life in this penal system. Which is absolutely, talk about a contrast, compare and contrast <laughs> to something like Shawshank Redemption, mm -hmm. where this guy's in prison is hell. Literally. It's, liter it's fucking hell. I mean, because if the prison guards aren't going to kill you, if the inmates aren't going to kill you, the environment definitely will, because they're in swamps, and they're in, like, really, they're, they're, they're in, like, terrible, uh, there's leper colonies, like, surrounding <laughs> where they're in prison, you know, and stuff like that, where disease will kill you before the prison guards or the inmates will. And, you, and, and it has a really, I mean, Steve McQueen is really very good in it, yeah, and boy. Dustin Hoffman is really good in it. It's sort of like a kind of twisted buddy film between it the is. two of it's, them. It's weird. It's like it's almost like the guys from Midnight Cowboy wound up being in prison together. That's what it sounds like. <laughs> yeah, and it was so he's yeah. But the only difference is they're supposed to be French. Yes, right? they're playing French characters with no accents. Right, <laughs> which is good. I, I that's one of my pet peeves, by the way, people, actors for whom English language is their first language, playing foreign characters insists on speaking the, uh, their lines in those, for, in those foreign accents, even though, theoretically, they would not be speaking to each other in those foreign accents. Like, like Nazi war films, where like, you have like, a British actor, an American actor playing Nazis, but they're using German accents with each other, right? <laughs> But they wouldn't be speaking in German accents with each other, right? They'd be speaking their natural tongue, so why would they have accents? So that's why I like Papillon, because they're not speaking in French accents, they're speaking in their natural accents. It okay. makes sense to me. I can see um, that. But yeah, I, 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 Papillon's one of my favorite prison dramas. I, find, I, I think it's a fascinating film. It's a bit of a masochistic experience, because you're constantly <laughs> rooting for the guys escape only, but you know they're not going to make it. <laughs> And uh, and there's another film to compare to that. Okay. Uh, cool Hand Luke. Oh yes, mm -hmm. that's the one I wanted to bring up. Which has yeah. a similar kind of like idea, a character that keeps wanting to escape and keeps failing, but keeps challenging the system by keep wanting to escape. And what's what's interesting about that film is the reason why he's in prison in the first place. I don't remember. Drunk. And with an underage girl. He's drunk one day and started knocking over like uh, um, parking meters. Oh, okay. You know, just out of drunken, like, whatever. And that's why he was in prison. So he's in prison for something very unsexy. You know? <laughs> it's not like he killed somebody. It's not like he robbed a bank. He just did something really stupid while drunk. But yet he becomes a symbol of defiance against the establishment. It also has that legendary Strother Martin line, you know, what we have here is a failure to communicate. communicate. I, that was a film I didn't expect to like. It was on a double bill with... It came on first, and then Bonnie and Clyde. It was on Channel 11. I decided... Oh, let me check this out before I watch Bonnie and Clyde. And I ended up uh, really liking the film because before that, not really a big Paul Newman fan. I think it's also an interesting film in how uh, they set up certain characters to be certain stereotypes. You have like the, you know, there's always that inmate that's going to be like his, his, his like, you know, mortal enemy, right? Mm -hmm. They set up George Kennedy to be that inmate. And then something happens where, no, they actually become friends. Let's quickly talk about Startup since that's a recent example because mm -hmm. we're going to talk about Startup and we're going to talk about uh, Escape Plan. 
two diametrically <laughs> opposite <laughs> takes well, on the prison say, drama. I seen a and they're plan, both though. very <laughs> recent <laughs> examples of the prison drama, right? And they're both I, like kind of. I guess. <laughs> right? Okay, so Startup. That was one of my favorite movies of last year. It was close mm -hmm. to being my favorite movie of last year. It was in my runner-up list. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was in your runner-up list, but it wasn't in your top 10? No, nah, it wasn't okay. even in my top 20. This startup is a prison drama. It's called Startup because it refer it's, a, it's a phrase referring to somebody who had spent a lot of time in juvenile prison is now being moved up into basically grown-up prison, adult prison. And that's called being Startup. And it focuses on a character played by uh, Jack O'Connell, mm -hmm. up-and-coming British actor in his own right, uh, who finds himself in an adult prison coming out of juvenile. Ben Mendelsohn, who turns out, and this isn't really a spoiler, he turns out to be the father of Jack O'Connell's character, and he makes it his mission to make sure that this character is not only protected, uh, but survives throughout his, his entire stay in prison, and he wants to use his influence to ensure that. Then you have this third character, Rupert Friend, and he's sort of like the guidance counselor. He's like the show, social worker. The Rupert Friend character mm -hmm. targets Jack O'Connell's character. He wants him to be a part of this group. Ben Mendelsohn's character gets jealous <laughs> that, this, that his son actually warms up to this group and starts to change as a result of that. And share. Right. Mm -hmm. But the film doesn't quite go where you think it's going to go, and characters don't quite uh, act the way you think they're going to act. And, and in other words, it's like real life. It doesn't call attention to itself. It doesn't call no. attention to itself, and that's what I loved about the film. Now, what was your, your issue with the Rupert Friend character? I guess, it, to me, it just seemed like the way he performed at first, he just seemed like he was just so saintly and patient. But then when it would come to, I guess, his run-ins with that other guard who kind of taunts him, mm -hmm. and then, you know, finally he kind of loses it, but... It's kind to me. It was like kind of more of a hissy fit than he was like uh, the assistant to the warden. Yeah, that's a character who he, seemed like you know like he has his own personal conflict with exactly. And he just and I guess the guards' whole thing was like this rehabilitation makes no sense. It's just a waste of time. And I just felt like I guess I I guess it's again like something I didn't expect. Maybe that's why it threw me off because I just felt his performance was just a little too I guess soft in a way. See, I didn't. I thought he was playing a guy that, at first, when you saw him, I initially saw him as, as while he believed in what he was doing, mm -hmm. and he was going to stand up for the rights of the inmates. You, at first, you're initially supposed to think, but he's kind of weak. He's kind of backing down too easily. He won't. And I, and I thought it was an interesting performance because if you notice, he doesn't look people directly in the eyes. Okay. Uh, like when, even when like like the assistant to the warden, who's like the head prison guard, you know, like confronts him on stuff, he's always like this. You know, kind of like this. And I thought it was an interesting character choice. Because as you, you initially think, okay, is this guy like, is he really going to have the prison mates' backs when push comes to shove? Or is he going to be one of these characters going to back off because he, is, he's in over his head? And it turns out that he is somewhat in over his head, but not for the reasons that you think. Okay. And the best, I, I, it's not really, I'm not really spoiling anything when I say this, it's, it's, but I'd, I'd like you guys just to watch this film and enjoy the reveals on your own. Let's just say that he's had his own history with anger. And, uh, and you find out that a lot of the reasons why he's behaving the way he does is because he's trying to keep himself in check. Yeah, I, I mean, I really enjoy Jack O'Connell's performance because I used to watch him on that uh, British soap opera Skins. Mm -hmm. And there were two scenes in particular. And he was in This Is England? Oh, yes, I forgot. He was also in that. And um, it, there are two scenes in particular that uh, really, like, riveted me in his performance. There's the one where he, well, it's later in the film when he's in group and his father first comes in. And this is when he's actually kind of bonded with the group and his father's trying to pull him out. And so he's going through the anger, but also trying to remember the things he learned in group. So I thought that was a really powerful scene. And the scene where he thinks an inmate's coming to attack him, and he attack, and you know he attacks the inmate, then realizes he actually came in peace, and then he tries to like save the guy and set him up, but make it look like he had nothing to do with it. I thought that was uh, another like kind of funny, but kind of like dark funny. Let's contrast start up to uh, escape plans. <laughs> I can I can say I've never a seen a sort escape of futuristic <laughs> high tech take on Escape from Alcatraz. I mean, the premise is uh, Stallone plays a security expert who's hired to you know be put in prison and and show uh, people who run prisons that you know there, you have security flaws in here. People can escape from your prison. I'm proving you that this can be done. Let me help you make it escape proof, right? Okay. And it turns out there is a prison. 
that apparently is impossible to escape from, and so they want to put Stallone in there to test that out as well. Uh, yeah, it's, and then it's, he buddies up with Arnold Schwarzenegger. He buddies up with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Oh, okay. and there's, a, there's a twist with who Arnold Schwarzenegger's character actually is. And, oh, and uh, yeah, it's it's all right. It's nice to see Sam Neill get a part again. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Sam Neill plays like the Charles Dance role from <laughs> Alien 3. <laughs> yeah, basically. It's 20 years too late. Yeah, it's it's just there's nothing. And also it kind of reminded me a lot of a um, a film from, from the, like, the late 80s called Fortress. Oh, yes. In a lot oh, of ways. I remember that Another film. prison, <laughs> although that's a futuristic prison dra- uh, escape drama, but... Christopher Lambert. Christopher Lambert, <laughs> you know, starring... Was that Stuart Gordon? Did he direct Fortress? Or was that uh, one of those guys? I, I, thought, I thought it was Christopher Gordon. Uh, uh, Stuart Gordon behind, like, the reanimator movies. I could be wrong about it. If, if I'm wrong, I'll correct myself mm-hmm. and post and all that stuff. But it reminded me of that a lot. We haven't talked about Midnight Express. Midnight yeah, Express is Midnight something Express. It's a very haunting film. Very, yeah. Oh, that's geez. that's that's a <laughs> great movie, and that's a disturbing as hell film. Talk about a prison environment that oh, looks like, like hell. hell. That was hell right. on earth, right? And, and and it made people scared to travel, especially. <laughs> you know, it killed tourism in Turkey for a while, I guess. You know? yep. I'm like, you had Randy Quaid, a young Randy Quaid yeah. in that film. John Hurt, um, the guy who was in Crime Wave, Paul no. Smith. Paul Smith. Paul Smith, yeah, the tall, bald guy. They yeah. dubbed his voice in Crime Wave. Yeah, Paul Smith. Yeah, he was one. Yeah. He was in that film. He was also in Blade Runner. No, I'd more remember him from Midnight Express. Uh, it had a, and, and Brad. Brad Davis. Brad Davis. Brad who Davis, Davis who had a very short-lived career. Oh, yeah. yeah. He had some problems, but yeah. he was amazing in this film. He was very good in this film. Written by Oliver Stone. Yeah. <laughs> one of Alan J. Parker's finest moments. Mm-hmm. Yeah, early in his career. Wait, did it say Alan J. Parker? Yeah, Alan J. Yeah, I think you meant Alan, Alan J. Paluka. Uh, yeah, you Alan, Alan Parker. Yeah. Alan Parker. Yeah. Alan Parker. Alan Parker. J. Paku was, that was one of his first films. <laughs> it only has one odd spot, even though I like it personally, but it doesn't fit the film. The Giorgio Moroda score. I don't know how you. I guys, love the score. I, I actually it have it. I, I don't mind this, it. This, <laughs> you know the whole disco sound that he was doing back then. But I mean, yes, he used it Scarface to a great effect, but. For some reason, like when he gets chased before he goes to the prison, when, he, when he's getting chased all around Istanbul by the cops, and you have that chase music, yeah, it, it, it just feels weird. But I thought it fits the chase because it's almost like his heartbeat as he's running away from the cop. Did, did, did Alan Parker make uh, Bugsy Malone before or after that? But I they, they, they made it close together, right? It's interesting. I like that. I'm going Malone to make a kids' film in this hard hitting. <laughs> a little kids' <laughs> musical. <laughs> That really set the standard for 80s films as far as, like, the look of it, you know, because mm-hmm. the MTV kind of style that was influenced in Europe, and that was pretty much his thing. Yeah, you had Alan yeah. Parker, and you had Adrian Parker Lynn. and... Michael Mann. Adrian of, Lynn, Lynn, yeah, was was sort of came after uh, that. Yeah. But you had Parker, and you had Michael Mann, actually, was around 79. That was Thief. Thief was 79, 80. 80. That was like, it, it was just, right? Yeah. But it was, it was like, yeah, it was made in 80. So that, wrapping up our discussion on prison dramas, see these films. If you've seen other ones that we hadn't mentioned, please recommend. We apologize if we hadn't brought them up. Uh, Check us out on Facebook. We have a Facebook page. Like us. Join our Facebook group where you can have cinephiles-like discussions with the other members. And there's a lot of them going on. Uh, We are almost reaching 3,000 members, actually. So I guess we have to talk about how we're going to celebrate that stuff. But uh, there's that. Check out our new podcast on thisisinfamous.com. Check out that podcast on iTunes and rate us, comment on us, download us. And keep watching our video content as you're watching right now because that's what got us here in the first place. Uh, Thank you very much. I'm Eric Cohen, co-producer, co-host of The Cinephiles. Andre Joseph, Jeff Galishaw, peace.